We are up to the final installment of the 48 Ways to Wisdom, way number 48. Our sages did a great service for us by organizing and codifying and canonizing and delineating for us and enumerating for us 48 different pathways, 48 different portals through which we can acquire Torah. Our goal in life is to develop, maintain, nurture, sustain, and deepen our connection with the Almighty. And the best way to do that is via His Torah. That's the most powerful, most potent, most incisive way that we can develop a relationship with the Almighty. And therefore, it's imperative for us to try to figure out what what can we do to acquire His Torah. There's an infinite amount of levels of Torah, and we could have a very, very surface understanding, a very superficial understanding. And once we go deep, we realize that there's, there's an infinite depth to it. And our sages were aware of that, and they understood that there's different ways to do it. There's different pathways, different means of acquisition of the Almighty's Holy Torah. And they organized for us 48 different pathways. And they're not mutually exclusive. Each one is its own pathway. Of course, the more pathways a person acquires, the greater their acquisition of Torah will be. And we're up to way number 48. Ha'omer davar b'shem omro. Someone who says a matter, a thing, in the name of the person who says that thing. Continues the Mishnah. Whoever says a matter, a thing, in the name of the author of that thing, that person brings redemption to the world. And he cites the verse in the book of Esther. Vatomer Esther Lamelech Bishem Mordechai. When there was an assassination plot to try to kill King Achashverosh, Mordechai got wind of it. He told Esther. She told Achashverosh. And she said to him, with proper attribution. She said it to him in the name of Mordechai. And as a result of that, when the king, later on in the story, when he was having a, a tough time falling asleep, and he pulled out the, the book of Chronicles, and he found the story where Mordechai saves his life, and he says, well, what was the reward given to him for this Deed, and they said nothing. And then Haman shows up, and he asks Haman, what should we do for the person who the king wishes to honor? And he says, well, we gotta, we gotta take the king's horse and the, the greatest of the king's minister, and they should march out the city, and they should make proclamations and announcements before him. Of course, Haman thought that this was for him. But this was ultimately for Mordechai, and Haman was forced to march him throughout the city and to proclaim before him so shall be done to the man whom the king wishes to honor. And that helped contribute towards the redemption that happened in the Purim story. And it all can be traced back to the fact that Esther told Ahasuerus about the the plot to kill him, and she gave it proper attribution. She said it in the name of Mordechai. So that's how our, our Mishnah ends. Chapter 6, mission number 6, that if someone says something with proper attribution, you say in the name of someone, of the real author, that brings redemption, and it's the last of the 48 ways to acquire wisdom. So this is the last of the 48 ways to wisdom, and it's the first one to have this addendum. Oh, not only does it bring you to wisdom, it also brings you to redemption, and it brings us a proof from Esther, she attributed the discovery of the assassination plot to Mordechai, and that proper attribution contributed towards the redemption of the people. So what is this idea of saying something in the name of its author, of properly attributing a statement, an insight, an idea, a novel idea in the name of its author? When you say over an idea, you say, well, so-and-so said this idea. Rabbi so-and-so says this teaching. This citation can be attributed to this and this originator of that statement. What's the deep idea behind that? And of course, the question that we have to ponder is why exactly is this a way for a person to achieve Torah? 
And what's the connection between this and redemption? That's kind of thrown in as a little bonus. Oh, it doesn't just bring you Torah, it also brings you redemption. It seems like a, like a strange thing. It's not uniform with the rest of the ways to wisdom featured hitherto. So the first thing is that if someone has the great privilege of studying the Talmud, you will notice that the Talmud is obsessive with proper attribution. You'll have many, many times in the Talmud, Rabbi so-and-so says, in the name of so-and-so. Who said it in the name of so-and-so? And then often you'll have that, and you say, no, 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 it's not Rabbi so-and-so, in the name of Rabbi so-and-so, in the name of Rabbi so-and-so, it's someone else. It's this rabbi, in the name of that rabbi, in the name of the third rabbi. So the Talmud spends, like, you know, very copious amounts of precious page space trying to do the accurate attribution. And the Talmud, in general, is very stimpy in its words. It's it's renowned for its brevity, but it spends a lot of time attributing the source of the idea accurately. And the commentators tell us that even God does proper attribution. There is a fascinating story in the Talmud. There was a debate between two of the sages. And at that time of that debate, one of the sages met Elijah the prophet, had a visitation with, with Elijah. And the sage asks Elijah, well, what's the Almighty doing right now? And Elijah responded, the Almighty is dealing with this halachic dilemma. That's the same dilemma that was debated in the academy. And what does God say about this matter that the two sages are arguing? So Elijah tells this sage that that God is saying, well, one of my sons, i.e. one of the sages, says this, and one of my other sons says that. This is an amazing teaching of the Talmud for a whole host of reasons. But one thing we see for sure is that the Almighty, so to speak, when he is studying Torah, whatever that means, whatever it means when Elijah tells us that God is dealing with this particular matter of Torah study at this time, he's being very accurate and saying, well, this sage says this, and this sage says that. Moreover, the Midrash tells us that when Moshe ascended to heaven, he heard the Almighty, so to speak, studying the Torah section of the red heifer. And the Almighty cited one of the sages. And Moshe is very surprised by this. Like the Almighty is citing one of the sages. And he says to him, Holy One, blessed is he, master of the world. The lofty ones, the angels and the galaxies, it's all yours. The lowly ones, it's all yours. And you're citing the the halachic opinion of one of the humans of, of flesh and blood? And God responded to Moshe, there's going to be a righteous person who will stand up in my world. And he is going to teach in this matter of the red heifer. And his name is Rabbi Eliezer. And this is what he says. So the mind is kind of fighting back, so to speak, and telling Moshe, no, 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 I'm going to attribute this to its author. Of course, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a mind-bending teaching in the Talmud because the author of the Torah is, is God. And you cannot say something which is not included in the Torah so obviously, Rabbi Eliezer, when he taught his teaching, it was what God said, or at least that's how he understood what God said. Yet, when God says it, he says it in the name of, of Rabbi Eliezer. Now, again, putting aside the theological problems in this series of, of teachings, we do see that the Almighty does proper attribution. Now, the Talmud tells us, that if someone does not do proper attribution, you teach something, you say over a piece of Torah, and you claim it's yours. This is my question. This is my answer. Am I a genius? That amounts to theft. It's the equivalent of me taking the border between your property and my property and moving it over. 
I'm encroaching on your field. I'm infringing on your property. That prohibition to not steal someone's property, it's not limited to their physical property. It's also their intellectual and spiritual property. If I claim your Torah insight is mine, that is theft. And the commentaries say, not only is it theft, it's worse than monetary material theft. If someone has possessions, physical possession, they have money, they got stuff, and I steal it, their association with their stuff, it's, it's, like, it's like what they own on a physical plane. It's what their body owns. When someone dies, like the, their material possessions, it's, it's very distant from them. But the spiritual possessions are almost the property of their soul. It's what they own permanently. If I steal something that someone would have otherwise owned permanently, that's a worse sort of theft than if I steal something that they only own really on a temporary level. So you have to properly attribute Torah ideas. And the sages took this very seriously. The Talmud has a remarkable story. One of the sages was giving a lecture and he said some idea, some halachic insight. And his student, who was there listening, went to his academy and he cited the same teaching. But he didn't properly attribute it to the original person, to the original sage. So Rabbi Eliezer, he taught this teaching and he didn't cite Rabbi Yochanan who was his teacher, who was the originator of this idea. So Rabbi Yochanan, he discovers this, and he's very disappointed, and he's very angry, and he, he's upset, and he has a grudge against his student. And this is a big problem, because these are the giants, the Torah giants, and, and, and there, there's some sort of tension between them. So the sages They start coming to the great rabbi, Rabbi Yochanan, and they're trying to appease him. They're trying to mollify him and assuage his feelings. So uh, a cadre, a cohort of rabbis come, and they try to appease him. And not only were they not successful, what they said made him even matter. And then a second effort was made. And this sage comes to Rabbi Yochanan and he cites a verse. And the verse says that just as God commanded Moshe, so too Moshe commanded, Moshe taught, Moshe instructed Joshua. And Joshua followed in the path of Moshe. Moshe was the teacher of the nation. He was the leader of the nation. He was the head of the people. Joshua did the same. He didn't vary off the path of what Moshe told him and what God told Moshe. So that's a verse in Scripture. And the sage tells Rabbi Yochanan, do you imagine that every single statement that Joshua made, he said, this is what Moshe told me? Every time he opened his mouth, he only said the Torah of Moshe. He was a student of Moshe. He was like a funnel of Moshe. Everyone knew that what Joshua got, he got from, from Moshe. In fact, the Talmud tells us that the, the face of Moshe was akin to the, the sun, and, and the face of Joshua was akin to the moon. And as we know, the moon merely reflects the light of the sun. Everything that Joshua said, everything he stood for, was just a reflection of what he got from Moshe. But Joshua didn't open his mouth every single time and say, this I heard from Moshe. It was understood. Joshua is the student of Moshe. What he says is what he learned and what he heard and what he studied from Moshe. So too, your student, Rabbi Eliezer. He is your student. Everyone knows that. When he opens his mouth and teaches, everyone knows it comes from you. And that indeed pacified him. But then the Talmud continues, and Talmud says, why did he care about it so much? It seems sort of petty, don't you think? 
It's kind of petty. Does it really matter? He didn't quote you. You have to have these, these groups of rabbis trying to appease you. Why was he so sensitive about his teachings being attributed to him? And the Talmud says something fascinating. Rabbi Yochanan understood that when you teach Torah, and that Torah is taught by your students onward, that keeps you alive. How so? The Talmud explains. There's a verse in Scripture where King David says, Let me live in your tents in multiple worlds. David wants to live, to exist in the tents of Torah in multiple worlds. Now we know you can't really inhabit multiple worlds. You're in one world or or the other. If you're in this world, you're in this world, and you're not in the other world. And if you are in the other world, well, you're not in this world. So what is David saying? Let me live in your tents in worlds. David is revealing that someone could be in the other world. They could be in heaven. They could be in the world to come. But if someone says over their Torah in this world, they are still alive in this world studying Torah, even though they are already in the next world. In the words of our sages, if someone is attributed in this world, if someone's Torah is taught over in this world, they may be dead but their lips are mouthing those same words of Torah in the grave. You have a great sage, passed away 900 years ago. We cite the Rambam today, we read his words in the grave, says the Talmud. The Rambam is mouthing those words together with us. We quote Rashi, every day we quote Rashi. We read the teachings of the Mishnah, of the, of the Talmud, of the Midrash, of the Zohar, of all the voluminous commentaries, Shulchan Arach, the Mishabrura, and so on, and so on, and so on. When we cite these great sages, their lips move in unison with ours. And therefore, they're able to live in two worlds. They're able to inhabit two worlds in the tents of Torah. That's why Rabbi Yochanan was so careful, was so perturbed by the fact that he was not being attributed He was losing, so to speak, his connection with that teaching. And then forever and ever, when that teaching is taught, he is not going to be attributed. And he won't have that eternal life, so to speak, in that matter of Torah, in both worlds. Now, I think there's a a very powerful insight here. A person who develops a Torah idea, a Torah insight, a Torah lesson, they have a permanent connection with that teaching. And even when they're dead, that teaching is still theirs, and it's still in this world, and they're still alive with that teaching in this world. It's a very powerful insight. And Rabbi Yochanan is telling us that that's only true if they are properly attributed. If you just teach over teaching, you kind of divorced it from the ownership of the original conveyor of that idea, you've claimed it as it, it's yours. You've stolen it from them. And now their connection with that is gone. That's why our is telling us it's worse than theft because it's like a permanent, eternal theft. And that's why Rebbe was so sensitive about this matter. So these are some of the ideas that our are telling us about the concept of, of saying a matter in the name of the original person who taught this. And if you do that, it's way number 48 to acquire Torah. Now, why would me attributing Rabbi Yochanan, Rashi, Rambam, whoever it is, attributing a teaching that I teach over in their name, why would that redound to me having more Torah? And the commentators offer a variety of answers. One idea is that, well, It's an aspect of humility. Imagine there's a brilliant insight. It's an earth-shaking insight. It's one of those insights that you hear it, you want to dance on a table. It's so amazing. And everyone wants, of course, ownership of that. I want it to be mine. Imagine how you feel if you come up with that insight. But you don't claim it as as your own. 
You say, no, 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 it's a brilliant insight. It's not mine. It's from this and this great sage. That's an act of humility. You are not claiming undeserved honor. You're not claiming stolen valor. You're willing to be content with less honor. That's humility. And as we know, humility is always a means to acquire Torah. We've said, we've said this a million times. Not quite a million times. We've said this a few times. We've said this repeatedly. Torah is like water. It pools in the low points. It pools in the humble. The more a person becomes humble, the worthier they are of being a recipient of the Almighty's Torah. And therefore, this is a way to become humble, to not claim something as yours, instead to attribute it to the proper originator, to the proper author of that teaching. There's another idea that the commentators say. We all want to have a little dazzle in our life, especially if you are fortunate enough to be studying Torah on some basis. You want your own insight. You want your own novel contributions towards Torah. You want to be able to get up there and say, this is my idea, let's go at it. Let me defend it. But if you can't steal from others, if that option is closed for you, you have to attribute it to the original owner. What choice do you have? The only choice left, if you want to be in the spotlight, is to do the hard work necessary to develop your own insights. If the easy path to appropriate someone else's work, if it's not an option, you're just forced to choose the harder path. And if you choose that path, if you are determined to say, I'm going to say my own insight, that process will advance your Torah greatness immeasurably. There's another way that the commentators address this Mishnah. And I will point out, just in case you have this question, all of the ideas that I said, it's the commentators, they say it. And you're like, wait a minute, tell me who said it. This is the actual Mishnah about proper attribution. Shouldn't you quote it in the, the, by the name of the author? I'll get to that in a second. It's a fair question. There's another possible interpretation. Okay, I'll tell you. This is from the Midrash Shmuel, okay? You heard it. You heard it over here. Okay. He, in one of his ideas that he writes, he says that this is a way to acquire Torah indirectly. Our mission says, if someone attributes a Torah te- teaching or anything in the name of the proper author, then they acquire Torah, but it's also a way to bring redemption. And we ask the question, like, why is he suddenly throwing in redemption? Like, I'm sure there's a lot of reasons to cause redemption. Like, well, that's not the subject of our Mishnah. Says the Medrash Shmuel. He says, proper attribution brings redemption. Redemption brings an increase in Torah. In the times of the redemption, in the times of Messiah, there's going to be a boom, an explosion, a bonanza of Torah. As the verse says, in that time, the land will be filled with knowledge of God. Kemayim layam machasim, as water covers the seabed. So this is a way to acquire Torah, not directly, but indirectly. If you attribute it the ideas, teachings, insights properly to the actual person who conceived that, well, that brings redemption. And redemption brings more Torah. It's like a syllogism. If A begets B and B begets C, well, then A begets C. So that's another way to understand how proper attribution leads to Torah. But we still have to understand How does proper attribution lead to redemption? What's the connection between proper attribution and redemption? And by the way, the commentators say that the flip side is also true. Improper attribution prevents redemption. What is the connection between redemption? We're we're always hoping for redemption. A lot of our prayers about Geula, redemption, we want to have 
what we call Messiah, but more broadly, the, the concept of achieving the goal of, of creation. We call that redemption. What does it have to do with proper attribution? So there's a very deep idea over here. My grandfather, Bus Memories, to say, people are connected to their Torah insights in a much deeper way than someone is connected to their property. You know, you have, you have property. There's a deed that says you own your house. So you own it. It's, it. This is yours. This this item, this piece of property belongs to you. But then someone passes. It doesn't belong to them anymore, right? We talked about that, how physical material property is only your ownership in this world. Spiritual property is yours for forever, for all eternity. On a deeper level, our sages tell us that every every Jewish soul is associated with a part of Torah with a letter, so to speak, in the written Torah. There are 600,000 souls and they correspond to the 600,000 letters in the Torah. That means that your your essence, the deepest part of who you are, is associated with a part of Torah. And if someone tries to take that away from you, that's like that's like stealing your, your most closely held and most most deeply intimate, intimately owned thing. Your Torah is, is is your eternal property. It's a manifestation of your permanent soul and it's forever bonded with you. So what happens when I say, okay, we have Torah here, a Torah insight, and we have a, a person, a soul. And I'm going to make sure they're connected. I'm not going to sever those two. When you keep something connected to its source, that is redemption. Redemption is to take a world that has been severed from its source, that has been severed from its creator, and to forge the bond between those two again. That's the definition of redemption, is to take the world and to bring it back to its source. If I take Torah and bring it to its source, that is the same act as redemption is, and that is why when I do proper attribution, I'm invoking the quality in the world that's needed for redemption. For the same reason our Sita's tell us that repentance, that brings redemption. Because what is repentance? A person who sinned becomes distant from their source, from their soul, from their creator. Repentance is to bring them back together, to reconnect the person with the person's source. That act is the act of redemption. So that's why, if there is proper attribution, there is redemption, and thus, syllogistically, we can understand how that brings about Torah. Because once there's redemption, the knowledge of God will sweep over the world in the same way that the water sweeps over the seabed. So how come I'm not doing it right now? Not only that, if you listen to my podcasts, I very rarely give these very long and detailed attributions. How is that not a violation of this Mishnah? So the Maharal saves me. Maharal, in his commentary, he says the problem is not that a person doesn't pinpoint the proper attribution. The problem is only if you claim as yours something which is not yours. If you steal and say this is mine when it's not yours, that's when it's dangerous. The big problem is to not take credit for an idea that someone else originated. You don't need to properly identify the originator so long as you don't claim it as your own, so long as you don't take credit for someone else's accomplishment, you're okay. If you steal, let's say it's yours, that's going to inhibit the redemption. If you say, listen, it's not mine, but the commentator said it. You're not saying it's me. It's the commentators. 
that's okay. And the reason why I, I have a defined names confusing, and I always think about you know, how do I simplify this for the audience. So if it's a name like Rashi, you hear that name all the time. So everyone who listens, they know that you know Rashi is a name that we're familiar with. You know, in this book, Perky Avos, we talked about Rabbi Yona a lot. Rabbi Yona does not comment on the sixth chapter of the book, so we haven't heard his name in a while. But if it's a name that you're going to be hearing a lot and you could develop a taste of who this person is, of who this commentary is, I will say the name. So Rashi, Ramban, uh, the works of the Rambam, uh, of course, the Talmud and, and Scripture, my grandfather, bless memory, I like to cite those names so you have a little bit of a familiarity with some of these personalities. But often I will say, well, the commentaries say it, the sources say it, the Kabbalists say it, and I do it to really keep it simple. I always know that whenever I read a book, I don't know. I think I'm the only one like this. I came up with, uh, I discovered recently with my wife that like if there's like a book and there's lots of names and you always forget who's, you know, who's who. I know I remember I was reading the, um, one of the Civil War books and I'm, I'm having a hard to remember who's a, who's a Confederate general and who's a Union general. I forgot because there's, there's 25 on either side. I don't remember. I know Lee and Grant that I know. I remember that. But I have a hard time keeping track of who is who. So that's, I always opt uh, for the sake of simplicity. Whenever it's a commentator, I'll just say the commentator say, and then I'm not in violation of this, so long as I'm not taking credit for something which is not mine. Now, why will this lead to more Torah? So the commentators say, that if you take credit for something which is not yours, you're displaying a lack of devotion to the pursuit of truth. You're corrupting truth by claiming as yours something which belongs to another. Torah, above all else, is the pursuit of truth. And proper attribution of ideas, or at least not claiming as yours, something which is others, which is another's, that is an act of standing up for the truth, and that makes you a better truth seeker, and thus a better candidate to receive the truth of the Torah. So I rely on this idea of the Maharal. As long as you don't claim it as your own, you're fine, but more broadly speaking, certainly the sensitivity of, of not taking someone else's property. We're all careful of that. We don't walk into cars. No, the car is open. Maybe we grab some stuff. Maybe we could be more fastidious about not taking someone else's stuff. Of course. But I don't suspect any one of us from taking someone else's property. Oh, no one's looking. Let me go grab it. That's not our way. Here we see that someone's Torah it's their deepest possession. It's the most intimate possession. It's the most permanent and eternal possession. And to encroach upon that, to infringe upon that, would amount to theft, theft of the worst kind, to attribute something properly, and certainly not to, to not misattribute something, that is a way to bring about redemption, and that's a way to deepen our connection with Torah. And that is way number 48, the final way to wisdom, Haomer, Davar B'Shem Amro to say something in the name of the person who said it. Thus concludes the 48 Ways to Wisdom. We are inches away from finishing the whole book, but we finished this Mishnah, and hopefully we'll all get a lot of wisdom and get a lot of Torah and hopefully improve ourselves along the way. I look forward to your questions, your comments, and your feedback. And as always, my email address is RabbiWalby at gmail.com.